Luke 24, the Emmaus disciples, at the end of the day, after walking with Jesus, they said to one another, did not our hearts burn as he spoke to us along the way and opened unto us the scriptures? And then later on, Jesus met with the 11 disciples and he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So we need God, the Holy Spirit, to give us illumination, to open our understanding that we might understand the scriptures. It matters not what translation you use. You can read Greek and Hebrew as I can. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't open your understanding, there are wonders you will not behold. And so let's pray Psalm 119, verse 18. And Lord, as we come today in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open our understanding, grant that we may behold wondrous things from your word. And we will not behold them if the Holy Spirit does not intervene and give us illumination. Give us today illumination. And then grant us the grace, Lord, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Grant us the grace, Lord, to see you today and to hear you. And I pray that we'll all leave this place saying, what a great God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today, I, I want to talk to you about prosperity, what the Bible has to say, what the Bible has to say about prosperity. Joshua 1, look at verse 7 again. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to what you like, all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest, what's the word, prosper, whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to what? Do. According to how much? All that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way, what? Prosperous. And then thou shalt have not just success, but what? Good success. What does the Bible have to say about prosperity? And these are the questions that we want to get an answer to today. Does God want everyone to be rich? Does God want us to be spiritually rich and materially rich? Rich materially. We want to make a distinction between those. Because a lot of places we're going to see where the Bible talks about riches, it's talking about spiritual riches, not material riches. Now, we want to establish at the outset, please hold on, hold on to this and I'll come back to it from time to time. The Bible is not against having possessions. I'm going to show you that in a moment. God is against being possessed by possessions. Understand the difference. You can have possessions and then possessions can have you. You can possess possessions and the Bible doesn't guess that. But when we become possessed by possessions, now I could give you many, many illustrations of people in the Bible who had great wealth, who had great possessions. 
and then those who were possessed by their possession. Let me give you two who had possessions, great possessions, but they were, they were not possessed by their possessions. I could give you more than that, but let me give you two. Job had great possessions. He was a rich man. But Job was not possessed by his possessions. How do I know that Job was not possessed by his possessions? Because when Job lost all of his possessions, three daughters, seven sons, three daughters, seven sons in one day. Imagine that. Three daughters, seven sons in one day. And then all of his material possessions. Read Job 1 and you'll see how many camels he had and oxen and all of this. He was, he was, he was, he was a wealthy man. But when he lost it all, the Bible says that he fell down and he worshipped and he said, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If Job had been possessed by his possession, he would have followed his wife's advice. He would have cursed God and he would have died or he would have committed suicide. But when Job lost everything he had, he still had what he valued most and that was God. He was not possessed by his possessions. And you know, that is why God could trust him. <laughs> God can't trust some of us with wealth. Some of us this morning, if God made us rich, we'd stop talking to him. We would. I'm, I got what I want now. What do I need with God? That would be the thinking. But whether rich or poor, we all need God because according to Job 12.10, Daniel 5.23, and a number of other places, uh, Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 20, God holds our very breath in his hands. Every creature. Job was not possessed by his possession. Abraham was a rich man. But he was not possessed by his possessions Abraham's most valued possession was his son Isaac. Genesis 22, Hebrews 11, when God told jo to, uh, Abraham to offer up his son Isaac, Abraham went to Mount Moriah and was about to slay his son, his treasure. He was not possessed by his possession. I could give you more. Men who were rich, wealthy, had great possessions, but they weren't possessed by those possessions. And that's why God could trust them with those possessions. That's why God could make them wealthy. That's why God could bless them with riches, because he could trust them. In my 40 years of pastoring, I've seen people come to church faithfully, prayer meeting faithfully, and then they get a promotion and make a little more money, and I, you don't see them anymore. Now, two men who were possessed by their possession. Luke chapter 12. There's a rich fool. Oh, read, read, read about the rich fool. Uh, he, he didn't have time for God, and he has so much material possessions that one night he's talking to himself. I have all these possessions, and my barns aren't big enough to hold all of these possessions, but this is what I will do. I will, uh, I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger barns, and I'll say to my, 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 my soul, I'll say to myself, uh, you know, eat, drink, be merry. You've got good stored up for many years. And uh, Jesus said that uh, God said, it, said to him, you fool. This night, your soul is required of you. Now, what's going to happen to all of those things that you have stored up? And then Jesus went on to say, so is everyone who is not rich toward God. And then there's the rich young ruler. Turn to Matthew. This one I believe we, we need to look at. It's something I 
want us to see. Matthew chapter 19. And uh, you can, if you have a study Bible, it will give you the parallel accounts, which are in Mark and also in Luke. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptics because they, they wrote with uh, the same point of view, the, the, the same view. And of course, each one, each writer was uh, writing to a, a different reader, and that is where they're the way that they describe events and so on are a little different. And Matthew, for example, is writing to the Jews, and he, he's writing to a Jewish audience, and uh, he, he's saying to, the, to his Jewish readers, this is the Messiah, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he pointed to Old Testament scriptures. You'll find throughout, in fact, if you haven't done so, the next time you read through Matthew, just notice the places where you'll see that it might be fulfilled. Jesus did this, that, or the other, that it might be fulfilled because that would be of interest to the Jews. He starts out with a genealogy. That would be of interest uh, to the Jews. And so he has a Jewish reader in mind. Mark, on the other hand, is writing to you know, Romans. He's writing to Gentiles. And he's writing to people who aren't interested in details. That's why his gospel is the shortest. He gets right to the point. Uh, he doesn't go into a lot of uh, details. And, and Luke is uh, writing also to Gentiles. In fact, Luke is the... Uh, is, is, well, there may be another one, but uh, is, is really the only Gentile writer. All the, the writers of the Bible are Jewish, except for Luke and perhaps one other, which is, which is debatable. And, and John, on the other hand, John's gospel is different from all of them. You know, all the other gospels, you know, they all start with the birth of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus, and so on. John goes back to before time began. In the beginning was the Word was the word the word was with god the word was god and and the verb was the, the occurrences of that verb it, it trans, translates not trans uh, late <laughs> i say that sometimes translate a greek verb that is in the imperfect tense which means continuous action in the past in the beginning was the word which means that the word was always there the word did not have a beginning the humanity of Jesus had a beginning, but not his divinity. The word was with God. The word was always God. There was a point in time when Jesus became man, but there was never a point in time when he, be, he became God. He was always God. And the word was with God. The word was always with God. Prastantheon, face to face. But now here, the rich young ruler, Matthew uh, chapter 19. And what, what, I want, what I want to urge you to do is look at the parallel accounts. As you look at the parallel accounts, each writer will give you at least one detail that's not given to you by the others. I believe as Mark points out that, that Jesus loved this young man. And he said, just look for that one detail in the parallel accounts, you know, that's different uh, from, uh, from the others. And so the rich young ruler, and, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, uh, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And, uh, and, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. So really what Jesus is saying here, he is not de denying his divinity. He's saying to this young man, do you recognize me as God? Do you know that I'm God? Are you recognizing me as God? It's, 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 what's, it's what's happening. But anyway, let's go on. And uh, Jesus says to him, if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, uh, which, which one, Jesus? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus goes on and on and on. And then the, uh, the young man says, I, I've kept all of these. In verse 20, the, the young man said unto him, all of these things have I kept from my youth up. What, what do I like? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that that thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. Now notice. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, Jesus didn't tell everybody to give up their possessions. The reason that Jesus told this young man to give up his possessions, because this young man was possessed by his possessions. And this is why Jesus told him to give them up. I mean, Jesus didn't say to everybody, give up your possessions. I mean, no, no, no. 
He told this young man to give up the possessions because this young man was possessed by the possessions. Now notice this. Verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Please notice verse 24 because this, oh, this answers a lot of questions. Verse 24. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And then the disciples asked, well, how can anybody be saved? And Jesus went on and said, you know, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. But please notice this. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, did you ever hear your grandmother say, talk about mother wit? You know, just mother wit, common sense. There's something here that we should see. I mean, you don't have to be a theologian to see it. You don't have to be a logician to see it. And that is this. Jesus said, it's, he, didn't say it's, he did not say it's impossible. He said it's hard. For a rich man to enter into the king, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Now, if it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom, why would Jesus want to make everybody rich? Does that make any sense at all? It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. If it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, why would Jesus want to make everybody rich, making it hard for them to enter the kingdom of God? Think about that. There's some things you should see there without being a logician or a theologian. Just common sense. And yet, there's this teaching that Jesus wants everybody to be materially rich. You are so quiet. You must want to be material. I must be stepping on your toes. <laughs> now, once again, Jesus is not against having wealth. Jesus is not against possessing possessions. Jesus is against being possessed by possessions. I know some of the scriptures that some of you are, are thinking, and we're going to look at all three. We're going to look at all of them. One, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more ab abundantly, John 10.10. 10. Is Jesus talking about spiritual life, material possessions, or is he talking about both? I'm come that you might be, that you might have an abundant life, that you might be uh, rich spiritually, uh, that you might be rich materially, that you might be rich uh, both spiritually and materially. As we go, that question will be answered, or those questions. Another one, delight thyself in the Lord, Psalm 37, 4. And he will give you the desires of your heart. You know what that verse means? If you delight in the Lord, God will put desires into your heart. And so that what you're desiring, what, what you're desiring is something that God has put in your heart. Delight, when you delight in the Lord, God will put the desires in your heart. Over 19 years ago when my wife and I built our first home, I wanted underground sprinklers because more than the, I mean, watering the lawn, it takes time and it's hard to get it right. And I'm very time conscious. I learned to be time conscious when I was working full time, supporting a family, and going to school, sometimes full time. I, I, I learned to take advantage of odd moments. And most of my homework actually was done, I had to transfer. To go to work, I had to transfer three times. 
And I did most of my homework while I was waiting for a bus because there were no distractions. Or while riding the bus. A lot of my homework. And uh, before I'd go to class, I'd take a nap and my wife would read to me. Uh, when I took Spanish, she would put the English on one side and the Spanish on the other side on three out of five cards. And, and I just took advantage of all. In other words, I'm very time conscious. And I learned to be that way. And so anyway, I just think it, I'd like to have underground water sprinklers, but I want to I wanna live a, a, I want to have a simple lifestyle, and I don't want to be too extravagant and so on. And, and you know, when I pray about something, God always answers me with a scripture, without exception. Without exception, even with the gray areas. He answers me with a scripture. And sometimes it's, is right away, and sometimes it may be a, a few days. But what, what the Lord impressed upon me is that verse. When I was wondering about, should we get underground sprinklers? Uh, and, and, and as I prayed, the Lord reminded me of Psalm 37.4. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And what, what the Lord reminded me is, look, is your delight right? Is your delight right? Because if you delight in the Lord, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. And so if your delight is right, don't worry about your desires. If your delight is right, don't worry about your desires. Do you like delight in the Lord? Do you delight in the word of the Lord? Do you like delight? Yes, I do. Then go ahead and get the sprinklers. And I did. But he answers me with the scripture. And so when we delight in the Lord, God will put the desires in our hearts. And so what we're desiring is what God has put there. And so it's, don't worry about your desires, worry about your delight. If your delight is right, your desires will be right. You see. And there's another one. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And you see, now, what I'm doing here is the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And so we're looking now at the commentary on Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, where God tells Joshua he's going to make his way prosperous and so on. He's going to prosper. Does this refer, you know, to material things or spiritual things or to both? Now, notice 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and notice verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. Jesus became poor that you might be rich. Now, what we're going to find out here is that this riches, is this material riches or is it spiritual riches or is it both? And we'll see in a, in a, in a few moments just by looking at the context. But please remember, Jesus, again, it says he became poor. Jesus was, was poor. Matthew 8, 20. Jesus said the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was born in a borrowed stable. Luke chapter 5, Jesus preached from a borrowed boat. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in a borrowed upper room in Jerusalem. In fulfillment of Isaiah 53, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. If you're only going to be there three days, why do you need to buy it? <laughs> Jesus was materially poor. Now, Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might be rich. Is this talking about material riches, 
spiritual riches or both. Now, when you're, when you're, when you're studying your Bible, you want to look at the immediate context in which a verse is found. And the immediate context will be the verses, the verse of verses before the verse, the verse of verses after the verse. That's the immediate context. And then you, you consider the, the chapters before the chapters after. And then you consider the rest of the Bible. What does the rest of the Bible uh, say about whatever it is you're considering? What does the rest of the Bible say? Let's look at the immediate context. Now, let's, let's look at the verse again. Let's look at the verse again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Now, let's look at the immediate context, and I want us to notice especially verses 2 and 7. And here... Well, here, just listen, because I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this from the New Century Version. And this, what I have here, by the way, is a, is a contemporary parallel New Testament, which has eight different paraphrases in translation. I said it again. Translations. And so... You can, you can understand a great deal. Now, you, you need illumination, of course, but there's a lot that you can understand by just comparing the different uh, translations and paraphrases. And I do like the New Living Translation, and I like the New Century Version. I like those. And actually, I, haven't, I have several translations, translations that I haven't checked yet, but in terms of accuracy, the New American Standard is perhaps at least the most accurate, but there are three that I, that I have in my library that I haven't, I haven't checked yet. Now, all the translations are, are reliable. They're, all, they're reliable. I went through it's what I consider to be the, the worst translation on the market, and I went through all of them, and I took some things that are essential, like you must be born again, things like that, and they all get it right. And so when it comes to the things that matter most, all the, all the translations are, are reliable. They get it right. But the, the reason that there are no, there are several reasons why there are no perfect translations. It's one, all translators, all theologians have a bias. And so when you come to a Greek word or Hebrew word or an Aramaic word that has two or three meanings, you're going to select the meaning that fits your bias. That's, that's normal. That, that happens. And then another reason, there's some words that you can't translate. There's no, there's no Hebrew uh, or, or uh, there's no English equivalent for it. For, John, for example, in John chapter uh, 10, I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish. Perish is in the middle voice, which is an action performed by the subject on itself. Well, we don't have any quick English equivalent for that. We don't have an English equivalent for a double negative. So there's some things that are untranslatable. And so what translators do in many cases, and the NIV is real good at this, is they give you an interpretive translation of the Hebrew or the Greek. And, uh, well, anyway. Anyway, they all are reliable. All the translations are reliable. None perfect, but reliable when it comes to the things that, that really matter. And this is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brethren and sisters, we want you to know about the grace God gave the churches at Macedonia. They've been tested by great trouble, and they are very poor. They are very poor. The church at Macedonia, they are very poor. This is the context to the verse that we read where it says, Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor that you may be rich. And so materially here, they're very poor. But they gave much because of their great joy. 
I can tell you that they gave as much as they were able and even more than they could afford. No one told them to do it, but they begged and pleaded with us to let them share in the service for God's people. And they gave in a way we did not expect. They first gave themselves to the Lord and to us. That is what God wants. So we asked Titus to help you finish this special work of grace, which is giving. Since he is the one who started it, you are rich in everything. You are rich in everything. Wait a minute, he just said they were poor. When he said they were poor, he's talking about materially you're poor. But then he says you're rich in everything. You're spiritually rich. And then he named some of the things in which they are rich. You are rich in everything. Number one, in faith, in speaking in knowledge, in truly wanting to help, and in love. And he goes on and on. And so, please, pay attention to what he's saying here about the riches. You see, God wants us to be rich in love. He wants us to be rich in kindness. Rich in forgiveness. Rich in compassion. Rich in prayer. Rich in praise. Job, Job was, was rich in faith. And that is why he could say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. All the days of my appointed time, I'll wait for my change. I don't know why I've lost my three daughters and seven sons. I don't know why I've lost my cattle. I, I don't know why I've lost my health. I don't know why my friends have turned against me. But this one thing I do know, my Redeemer lives. That he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were rich in faith. When the king told them, maybe you didn't understand the command at the sound of the music, everybody must get down and bow. And these young teenagers could have very easily rationalized their situation. They could have said, everybody else is getting down. We might as well get down too. And if we get down with them, nobody will know that we got down. We won't stand out. And so we'll just get down with them this one time. And, and as we get down in our hearts, we won't be worshiping this idol. And so we can just, just do what everybody else is doing. But no, they said, no, no, no. One of the reasons they were in Babylon was because of idolatry. The king said, that if you, you don't bow down, we're going we're to put you in the fiery furnace. I want to give you another opportunity. You know what said? We're not careful about how we talk to you in this matter. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. He's able to give me a promotion, but if he doesn't, he's able to heal me of cancer, but if he doesn't, he's able to make my enemies leave me alone, if he doesn't. I will still trust him. That's the kind of faith God wants us to be rich in. Rich in faith. Now, look, just look at the broader context. Here's some of the things that Jesus said. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew chapter 6, lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth where thieves can break through and steal and, and the moth and, and the rust can get to them. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
And Paul said in Colossians 3, 1, I believe it is, set your affections where? On things above. Once again, God is not against possessing possessions. God is against possessions possessing us and taking his place in our lives. Listen to Paul. Listen to Paul. At this time, we're going to use, we're going to use the New Living Translation, which is really, it says translation, but it's really a paraphrase. Just listen. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want you to notice first verses 6 through 12 and then 17 through 19. And again, this is the New Living Translation. Yet true religion with contentment is great wealth. Read it again. Yet true religion with contentment. When you, when you have... When you're content with what you, what you have, and the writer of Hebrews tells us that, you know, if you have food and you have clothing and you, and, and you have shelter, learn to be content with that. And Paul says in Philippians uh, chapter 4, I believe it is, I have learned, and this is something you have to learn, I've learned to be content whatever state that I am in. I've learned to be content when I have a lot. I've learned to be content when I don't, I don't have much. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 again. Yet true religion with contentment is great wealth. After all, we didn't bring anything with us when we came into the world. And we certainly cannot carry anything with us when we die. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. If we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. How many times have I shared with you Three of Satan's weapons against us that have been working since the beginning of time. They continue to work. They, they, have, they haven't stopped working. If you read today about somebody falling, it's going to be because of pride, sinful pride, money, or sex. Rarely will you read, or if ever, will you read or hear about anyone falling for a reason other than one of these three. Why should Satan change? They work to perfection. And what, what I can't understand is how men can see these things happening over and over and over again and still become, become victims. All right, let's, let's go to, let's just go to Chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. First Timothy, chapter 6, 17 through 19. Tell those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone, but their trust should be in the living God who richly gives us all we need for enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works, 
They should be rich in good works and should give generously to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of real life. Now, I could go on and on with that, but please just remember context. If you take 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, and you don't read the other scriptures, you don't consider the immediate context, you don't consider the broader context, then you can take that verse to say, Jesus was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty we might be rich materially. And many do that. Learn to study the Bible for yourself. Study it for yourself. This book of the law shall not depart from out of thy mouth, but thou shalt do what? Meditate. Three meanings of meditation that I want us to remember. Number one, to imagine something, uh, to think about something, to speak in an undertone, to mutter, to talk to yourself. That's meditating. Day and night. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight or her delight is in what? The law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates or she meditates when? Day and night. No, no, no. You do it when there isn't anything on TV to watch that's worth watching. Day and night. And he shall be, or she, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And when a tree is planted by the rivers of water, it has everything that it needs to constantly carry on the process known as photosynthesis. And then the leaf doesn't wither. It will always have everything that it needs to be productive and to be fruitful. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in the season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does will prosper. God wants us to prosper, but it's mainly spiritually that he wants us to prosper. And read Ephesians and just notice, first of all, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, spiritual blessing, not material blessing, but spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians talks about the riches of his grace, the riches of his, 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 his uh, uh, glory. And, and Romans, the riches of, his, riches of his kindness. He's rich in mercy. So many places where the, the Bible is talking about prosperity and it's talking about, and you can do the study yourself. Just take a concordance and just look up the word rich and the words rich in prosperity. Many places God is talking about spiritual riches. And again, God doesn't mind us being rich as long as our riches are not taking us from him. And please remember this. If you don't take anything else away, take this away. God has created in everyone. Everyone. He created a spot just for him. He created a spot that only he can occupy. He created a spot, the triune God, that only the triune God can satisfy. You can search this world over and you cannot satisfy a longing that God put in you. He made us that way. This is for me. This is for the triune God. And only the triune God can satisfy. Sex won't do it. Money won't do it. Fame won't do it. Possessions won't do it. You see. 
He satisfies. And you know, uh, the Lord blessed me to travel to every place in the world that was on my list. There's no place in the world that I want to go that I haven't been. And the place to which I travel several times is Israel. And of all of the places that I travel, Israel would be at the top of the list. And if you've never been to Israel, go if you get an opportunity. For a believer, I don't, I don't believe you can top Israel. You walk where Jesus walked. And in Israel, there's, there's some places where there's a question as to whether, is this the right place? But there's some places where there is no other place. So you know it's the right place. For example, the, the Dead Sea, called in the Bible the Salt Sea. No other place can be the Dead Sea. The Mediterranean Sea, called in the Bible the Great Sea. There's no other place. The Sea of Galilee. There's no other sea that can be the Sea of Galilee. So you know you're in the right place. And and one of the things that I enjoy doing in taking groups to Israel is that uh, every day there'd be a place where where individuals, you know, would have this, this, this moment, this overwhelming sense of the presence of God, the manifest presence of God. For, for Brother Tommy, Minister Tommy Hoard, it was uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, for Pastor Hopgood, it was the, uh, the manger in, in, in Bethlehem where Jesus is believed to have been born. And for many, it, it was the Jordan River. So in other words, I, en- I enjoy just, just watching those experiences. And of course, the other uh, place w- was the Western Tour the Johnsons and the Faroes, we did a Western tour. That was really exciting. And so Israel and the Western tour, those, those would be at the top of the list. But I've been everywhere I want to go. And I've had some profound moments uh, in Israel. But my most profound experiences with the triune God have been at home alone. And what I'm saying is that you don't have to go to Israel. (laughs) You don't have to go to some point in the the world to experience, to have a profound experience of the manifest presence of the triune God. It can happen right where you are in your home. And all of the places that excite me, nothing excites me more than the manifest presence of the triune God. And nothing satisfies me more, I should say. And nothing satisfies me more than the word of God. And so God said to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. And so blessings follow obedience. You see this throughout the Bible. Blessings follow obedience. And this is why one of the reasons we sang this morning, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Deuteronomy 28, there's a list of blessings for obedience to Israel, God's people. If you will obey me, these are the things that I will do for you. If you disobey, these are the curses that will follow. And sometimes people come to me and talk to me about curses and generational curses. And I say to them, listen, all you need to do is just obey God's word. Curses come because of disobedience. You break curses by obeying. Because it was somebody's disobedience that caused the curse. And my praying over you, anointing you with oil, is not going to break a curse if you're not obeying. Read Psalm 81. And in Psalm 81, God lists some things that might have been if his people had obeyed him. I would have done this for you. I would have given you honey out of the rock. The, The hard places in life, I would have made them sweet for you. 
I would have been an enemy to your enemy. But you wouldn't hearken unto me. You wouldn't obey me. The Assyrian captivity. The northern kingdom was taken into captivity by the Assyrian. The southern kingdom, Judah, was taken into, king, into captivity by the Babylonians. You know why? Their disobedience to God. If they had obeyed God, these captivities would have been avoided. And in Amos chapter 4, verses 6 to 11, God is pleading with the northern kingdom. In fact, he's, he withholds the rain and he, he sends, a, uh, he sends a, 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 a pandemic. Amos 4.10. There's damage to the food crop. There's war. And God is doing all of this to get his people to obey him, to recognize, repent, and return to him. And there's a refrain that occurs five times. Yet you have not returned to me. I withheld the rain. Yet you have not returned to me. I damaged your food supply. Yet you have not returned to me. I sent pestilence among you. They're like the pestilence that I sent among the Egyptians. Yet you have not returned to me. Do a study this week. Sunday school teachers, small group leaders. Just do a study of the consequences of disobedience in the Bible. Consequences of disobedience in the Bible. Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, Romans 5.12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death is passed to all men because, because of sin. Moses missed the promised land. You know why Moses missed, missed the promised land? On one occasion, God told Moses to smote a rock, picture of the crucifixion. And there was another time when the people were without water, and God told him to speak to the rock. Not hit it, speak to it. One crucifixion. So we don't do that anymore. We speak to it. But Moses, in his anger and so on, he hit the rock. And God told him to speak to it. You know what? Moses missed the promised land because of his disobedience. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 10, I believe it is. And they died before the Lord because of their disobedience. Joshua chapter 7. Achan stole some material. He coveted some things, buried in his tent. Read Joshua chapter 7. And as a result, many lost their lives because of this man's disobedience. Many lost their lives because of David's disobedience. Jonah chapter 1, the cargo on the ship was thrown overboard because of Jonah's disobedience. In Jonah chapter 1, God told Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh and preach the preaching that I bid you. And Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going the opposite direction. I'm going to get as far away from God as I can. Now, Jonah, you, man, you can't get away from God. God is everywhere. And the Bible says, Jonah got on a boat, ship going in the opposite direction. And you know, you know what Jonah could have said? I must be in the will of God because when you're in the will of God, things line up. When you're in the will of God, you have a peace. And that's true. But if you disobey the word of God, it's possible for things to line up. It's possible for you to have peace and still be out of the will of God because you're disobeying the word of God. And Jonah, listen, Jonah had so much peace that he was sleeping in a storm. And this was an unusual storm. You know how I know it was an unusual storm? The sailors called a prayer meeting. When you get a, a group of cursing sailors to say, let's have a prayer meeting. Hey, something is going on strange here. These sailors were having a prayer meeting and Jonah was sleeping. And they woke him up. Oh, sleeper, get up, man, and call on your God. Whoever your God is, call on <laughs> Now, here's what I want you to see. In Jonah chapter 1, God said to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. And preach the preaching that I bid you. He didn't do that. And so there's a chapter 2 where God prepares a big fish. And don't get into an argument about a whale and all this. Look at here. The God who stepped out on nothing, made a world out of nothing, hung it out on nothing, and told it to stay there. 
If a God can do that, I don't have any problem with him preparing a fish. The Bible says God prepared a fish. It may have been a whale. It may have been, did God say, whatever it was, God prepared it to swallow John. And so you have a chapter two. And then in chapter three, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You know what? What God said to Jonah in chapter one, he said the same thing in chapter three. And so chapter two didn't have to be there. But chapter two was there because of his disobedience. And many of us have chapter twos in our lives. And let me tell you something. Listen, what God said to you in chapter one, he's not going to change. And you can get rid of, you can get rid of, some of you got chapters five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You can get rid of some of these chapters if you do what he tells you in chapter one because he's not going to change. So anyway, Jesus said, John 13, 17, if you know these things, happy makarios, and that word makarios can be translated can be translated happy, it can also be translated blessed. In the Old King James, in Matthew chapter, that's how, Matthew, that's how the Old King James translates Makarios, blessed. Happy or blessed are you, if you what? Do them. Be what? Doers of the word and what? Not hearers only. John 2, 5, whatever he says unto you, what? There was a miracle in Cana of Galilee, John chapter 2. And the reason that there was a miracle in, miracle in Cana of Galilee, Mary said to the servant, whatever he says unto you, do it. And they did what Jesus said, and the water was turned to wine. As you read the story of Joshua, you see, Joshua saw some miracles because of his obedience. Joshua saw the, the, the waters of the Jordan uh, part. Well, Joshua saw the walls of Jericho fall down. And Joshua was in a battle and God promised him victory and so on. The sun's going down. He needed more sunlight. And Joshua said, sun, stand still. And God stopped the earth from revolving around the sun to give Joshua more daylight. And I wonder if some of us are missing miracles because... Whatever he says, we're not doing it. Are you missing your miracle? How many blessings are we missing? How many miracles are we missing? Because we're not obeying God's word. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for these reminders. You're not against having possessions. You are against our being possessed by our possessions. Grant us the grace, Lord, to, to love you as we've been commanded to do in Matthew 22, 37 and following. Greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all that's in you. Oh, grant us the grace, Lord, to grow in our love for you and in our value of you. And I pray, Lord, for anyone with us or listening who has not made peace with you through the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today you would move the barriers and that you, Lord, would draw someone to yourself. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just quietly pray these words to him, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm lost, that you're the only one who can save me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again bodily from the dead. Today I want to receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Give me the grace to repent. Give me the grace to believe. Give me the grace to receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. And I pray in your name. Amen. I stand for the Arianic blessing first in Hebrew, then in English. Yeva rekeka Adonai veyish merika. Ya Adonai panal eleka vikuneka. Yisa Adonai panal eleka veyasim eleka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.